There's going to be a lot of demand for environmental services over the next five, 10 years. There's a lot of stuff out there that can be adaptively reused and recycled. It's a really great time to operate a small troubleshooter shop. This is season five of In Good Companies from Cades Bank, the podcast where we share the forces shaping your business to help you navigate the opportunities ahead. Because that's what Cadence is all about. The expertise and flexibility to do business on your terms. We're empowered to help, whether it's through our podcast or any one of our more than 350 locations across the South and Texas. Great business often starts with a need that hasn't been met. Whether you're operating in an emerging field or offering a new service within an established industry, a good niche holds unique potential for your company. Today's guest knows this better than anyone. I'm Robert Brauner, owner, founder, and lead principal of One Consulting Group in Atlanta, Georgia. Robert Brauner is an environmental consultant. With his firm, One Consulting Group, he helps businesses fix the issues on their sites, whether that's health and safety assessments or removing asbestos. And the thing is, Robert started in this field before it was on everyone's mind. Back in the 1990s, when the discussion on climate change was still taking shape, he was already digging out landfills and educating clients on regulations. It really was kind of the Wild West back then of trying to figure out how to clean these properties up. There wasn't a whole lot of code and a lot of the local permitting and city officials, they wanted to stay away from it. They didn't want to touch it. But Robert stuck to it. He built two successful environmental consulting firms in Atlanta, Georgia. And 30 years later, what was once a relatively niche market is now a place of steady growth. As a matter of fact, revenues in the sector are expected to rise by 10% in the next two years. So in this episode, Robert shows us how to identify a good business niche and dig in. He unveils the strategies that seeded his company, and we reflect on the forces at play within the environmental industry today. All along, we draw lessons from Robert's inspiring professional journey, which starts in his home state of Georgia. I guess I'll start kind of in the beginning. I went to the University of Georgia, and about midway through college, I realized that I wanted to work in the environment. And it was really from a love of being in the outdoors and hiking and camping, you know, with a kind of a youthful expectation. I thought I was going to be hanging out with the bugs and the bunnies with a backpack. At that time period, it was like the mid 90s. So I, I got two degrees, one in anthropology and one in biology to straddle the coursework I needed to have a good educational background in environmental science. And so when I got out of school, I wanted to live out on the West Coast. So I moved out to Oregon and I was working really in construction, pounding nails and building houses while I was trying to break into the environmental industry as a whole and spent a bunch of time in the library at the University of Oregon reading trade publications and educating myself on, you know, what the environmental industry looks like, you know, and where there were jobs and where there were salaried positions that had value. So then I started working for an environmental temp agency that uh, outsourced environmental labor and I started working for larger industrial contractors, remodeling gas stations, putting landfill liners in, doing more shovel work in the beginning, and then kind of graduated to running heavy equipment. It was called Yellow Iron back then, you know, backhoes and trackhoes, and doing more of the industrial contracting side of the environmental game. So it seems like you really did a lot of this learning of, of the science you're in after college, just all on your own. Yeah, I did. And, you know, every now and then I would have to get creative because I would kind of run out of avenues of information. And uh, one time I even, I called all the environmental consulting companies in the Portland phone book and I pretended to be a um, reporter from the Oregon State newspaper <laughs> and just pumped them for information and asked them a million questions. And it was really funny. As someone looking for a job, I got a lot of, you know, like, you know, we're not hiring click. But, you know, when I 
kind of faked that someone was interested in what they had to talk about from a media level. It was amazing, like how much people would would tell me and all the kind of the wizard behind the curtain they revealed. So I, I really learned a lot doing that. That, that's pretty funny. That's a creative way to get information there. Yeah, it was hard to get them off the phone sometimes. At that time, were there set procedures on how you did this or was some of it kind of learning as you go and different companies were developing different techniques? It was pretty early on. Yeah, the, the International Fire Code Institute, IFSI, it had some specifications. The you know the Petroleum Equipment Institute had some specifications that I'd become pretty well versed in while I was hanging out in the library, and I read a couple of books that I really liked and that kind of gave me a framework for things. One was the Blue Ocean Strategy by um, Tan Kim. That book lays out a strategy of blue oceans and red oceans and red oceans are where everybody's competing kind of for the same thing and they're churned up and difficult and really disruptive. And so I'm always looking out there for the blue ocean where, you know, I'm the first person to be in the water and where people are, uh, or businesses have a real need for someone who's out there problem solving and creating new solutions to things that are cropping up because our business is regulation driven. I mean, I eat real good because of government regulations and I'm grateful for them. So I, I think that blue ocean strategy translated into how to kind of keep your eye out for new regulations. In Oregon, Robert developed his skills against all odds. Running pipe and heavy equipment, he didn't just gain experience. He built an entrepreneurial vision. In fact, if there's only one thing you should know about Robert, it's that he is a self-starter. After a few years in Oregon, he moved back to Georgia, and he set his eye on the next opportunity. I moved to Atlanta right after the Olympics, and post Olympics, there was a property development boom. You know, in Oregon, I would have had to work for 10, 15 years to prove that I was going to stay on the West Coast and be valuable to a company. But when I got to Atlanta, it was so busy and they were letting really young people take on some pretty serious roles in business that, you know, you would normally expect someone who was more mature, seasoned, maybe a little older would have done. So again, the kids were running the asylum in Atlanta and the developers in town were driving really nice cars and they own nice buildings. And so I was like, huh, I was like, I think there's might be some work there. So with all that, how did you make the shift into the consultancy of in the environmental field? I got a job working for uh, this company called Epic Engineering, working for a guy named Paul Lamb, a really great engineer who had just started his small environmental consultancy here in Atlanta, mainly cleaning up gas stations. Because in the late 90s, there was a construction code for the underground tanks and piping that um, dispense gasoline at gas stations. A new code was called for, and all these gas stations had to be remodeled. And so out the gate, I started and had 50 environmental cleanup sites to assess and remediate underneath a a state-level program. And so working for that first firm, it kind of showed me the guidelines of, of how to do the work and the amount of detail that went into it and the amount of thought, as well as how to organize complicated technical information into a report format to where people could read it and understand what was going on. I was the first employee. And so it was the two of us for a minute. And then we started to grow and we got to 12, 15 employees and started to doing some real revenue. We were crossing, you know, a million, two million a year in gross. And my boss came to me and said, hey, you know, I want you to stay here and I want to keep you motivated. So I wound up becoming a partner there. And then at that time, we were doing mainly, like I said, gas station, petroleum, underground storage tank work. But then once I had some skin in the game... I started casting my eye outward at different business to maybe engage, you know, our assessment and remediation practice. Learning from experience, Robert built up his industry knowledge and skills. And soon, he wasn't just cleaning up building sites. He was looking at the big picture 
and asking himself, where could I go next? Where are my skills needed? Some of these commercial districts, right, that we're starting to redevelop as people move back into the urban core in Atlanta. And so that gas station property went from being kind of a dead gas station or maybe a automotive repair that it wasn't that great of a tenant to a shiny new pizza place or maybe a restaurant or maybe a clothing boutique. And so I started marketing developers to say, hey, we can come in and clean up this property and get government approval that it's you know safe for reoccupancy. And we'd like to do that work for you. And this was like right around 2000 plus or minus. And things really started to take off. It became obvious that the development community needed like an environmental Swiss army knife that understood how to clean up soil and groundwater, but also needed to to resolve maybe asbestos in the flooring or in the insulation in the building. Uh, perhaps there was a poor condition lead-based paint that needed to be addressed. Sometimes it was even like new construction where we were asked to put in a grease trap for a restaurant because that was a new emerging building code issue. And since we knew how to remove and put in gas tanks, uh, it was it was easy to put in a old water separator. So... During that time period, business just really grew very, very quickly in the Atlanta's urban core. And then that grew to Savannah and Tampa and Jacksonville. So you see, to grow the reach of his first firm, Robert looked beyond his purview. He thought critically about the environmental needs at play in other sectors. But when he grew his clientele, he picked out his projects with intention. I think there were two really guiding principles in the environmental practice that I've developed. One, I wanted to stay close to protecting water and keeping an eye on water use and staying close to that, you know, at least in informational circles. And the other thing I believed in then, and it's an ideology, and I still believe in it now, is I wanted to work in already developed areas and recycle that property and find adaptive reuses for it so that we continue to operate in what's called the brown belt, which is where, you know, things have already been developed so that we wouldn't cut down new trees in the green belt. And so that really focused me into these urban cores, such as, uh, you know, Atlanta, Birmingham, Jacksonville, Savannah, Nashville. We clean up, you know, city property. And that would be the niche that I look for, for our business model. Keeping your focus. That's how you grow within your niche. And for Robert's first firm, it really worked. When he started with them in 1997, he was employee number one. But by 2006, the company had several divisions and employed 65 people. Beyond oil and gas and property development, the firm began working with financial organizations. But then some cracks started to show. I kind of saw the 2008 financial crash coming a couple of years early. We had a full banking division that was doing property assessments prior to lending transactions. We were doing work for Lehman Brothers, uh, Morgan Stanley, Bayer. And I started to see just some instability in that business model in that there just wasn't a lot of focus on due diligence. It was more about getting deals done. We had a few of our clients that were telling us the due diligence information that they wanted in their reports. And I, you know, I was like, this really isn't third party due diligence if, if you're telling me what to write, you know? And so I saw some instability in that business model. And I, you know, I went to my partnership and we talked a little bit and they wanted to go all in and grow the company to a, a really large size based on these securitized transaction volume. I just didn't see that as a sustainable business. And so, you know, we amicably parted on a Tuesday in February. I decided it was time for me to, to move on and have a smaller, more local, regional boutique shop 
And because all those guys were really great, we worked out a, a business deal to where I left on a Tuesday and started billing on a Wednesday with the new company. It was really great. I, I have a lot of respect for those guys and we still keep in touch, you know, and that would be some advice to anyone, you know, when you, you leave a business relationship, don't burn bridges. You heard Robert. Even when you leave a business, keep your network active and tend to your relationships with former colleagues. Because when things get rough, they can help you out of a bad turn. So early days, what were the challenges that you faced and how did you deal with those? Oh, man, I would say the crash of 2008 was the first big challenge. We were two years old. Uh, I think at that time period, we were at three employees and a part-time intern handling the administrative stuff for me. And the real estate markets collapsed because the lending market just, you know, it froze. And, you know, as a business developer, the scariest sound is the phone not ringing, right? You know, there was a six month period where nine out of our top 10 clients either disappeared or were on the verge of insolvency. And I was taking phone calls where I was like, man, I, you know, we don't have the money to pay your invoice right now kind of situation. And and during that time period too, there were weeks where the phone didn't ring and you didn't get a significant or consequential email that would lead to business. And it got scary, you know, it really did. So did you ever find yourself sitting, you know, telling yourself, I knew this was coming. Why did I do this right now? (laughs) (laughs) No, no, I just went fishing. You know, I decided, (laughs) heck man, if if there wasn't work to do, I might as well do something I enjoyed. And so there was a, a fair amount of free time. So after 2008, how did you pivot your growth strategy to keep moving as the big real estate boom was finished? What did you focus on then? After 08, a new structure was started to evolve definitely within the the lending community you know the banking regulations starting to started to tighten up a new group of opportunistic developers started to emerge. And so we were able to kind of access new relationships and things weren't so etched in stone. And we started seeing kind of new process evolve. And we got really fortunate, like a good friend from college has a large kind of public works contracting firm. They're called the Astra Group. And we teamed up with, with that group on a city project called the Atlanta Beltline. If you've never heard of the Atlanta Beltline, here's some context. In 1999, a graduate student at Georgia Tech named Ryan Gravel looked at an old map of Atlanta and noticed a loop of railways around the city. These corridors were abandoned or underused. He wrote his master's thesis on the subject and the city picked up his idea for the old railways. The project? redevelop the area to improve transportation, open up new green spaces, and bring together communities that had been historically marginalized. This project would re-energize the core of Atlanta and give Robert's firm a new lease on life. We were uh, very fortunate to win a bid of cleaning up the first big piece that started of the Atlanta Beltline, we basically went in and we cleaned up an old 1930s WPA landfill. It was uh, dug out and removed and a beautiful stormwater park was put in after we got everything cleaned up. And then we were monitoring the health and safety as this larger contractor group was removing the old rail lines through these residential neighborhoods. And then once the Atlanta residents started to see what this transportational connectivity could do for the city, it really took storm. It was great, you know, good revenue. It really buoyed us after that 2008 crash when things got squirrely. And we went from doing a lot of private side to working for municipal public side. It really pointed me in the direction of where is private development going to go? And what the city put into developing this area of the Beltline, there's been tenfold private reinvestment into the areas that surround it. So, you know, for us, I I really now I'm really looking for areas in other cities where there's a a really great public-private partnership that's created leverage to do some environmental cleanup. So that that sounds like this adaptive reuse is is something that's uh, really hot right now. Is that demand for that increasing? 
I would say absolutely. That's 80% of our business working on already developed property and working on its next use, especially right now, considering the difficulty that the commercial office space is having, getting people back to the office, a large inventory of class C and class B uh, office building types that are becoming less and less competitive for attracting employees. I'll give you an interesting statistic. There could be up to 60% of these smaller B and C office complexes that are under demolished, meaning they may not ever be competitive again within the the real estate business, and they might need to be you know demolished and go away. So buildings can actually die, even though they're not a sentient living being. When you start shutting down the systems and you turn off the water and the electricity. And they're not climate controlled anymore. I think we're going to have some real problems to solve uh, moving forward. So, yeah, there's a lot going on right now in that office space and a lot of people trying to figure out what to do next. Hey, it's Taylor from Cadence Bank. Your bank's treasury management specialist should be a vital member of your team. They can help you improve cash flow and maximize returns on your excess capital. Here are some ways that they can advise you. Integrating bank data, automating and centralizing your accounts receivable and payables functions, account consolidation, and guarding against fraud. Talk to you again next week. Growing within your niche is a juggling act. It asks that you stay active and reshape your expectations because your industry is growing at the same time as your business. In short, you always need to be asking, what's next? And in the environmental sector, that means taking a hard look at the future. So let's kind of turn to kind of the big story, climate change. How has climate change and the urgency around climate change kind of changed your practice? That's a really good question. What's really created, you know, a revenue stream for us is this idea of volatile emissions, you know, everyone's starting to think about the air, you know, and what's causing the the atmosphere to heat up. Well, it's also got people thinking about their exposure to, you know, volatile chemicals, perhaps uh, in construction, perhaps with the nail salon, you know, smelling acetone. And so we're starting to really see what I call end of the pipe problems, like spillage that we clean up a historical accident or problem that wasn't a known problem um, when it happened. And we're starting to see what I call a real consumer concern about let's head this off at the front of the pipe before it becomes a problem, right? When I first started out in the 90s, a lot of times the owners or the developer would kind of look at me like, wait, you want me to go find more problems? You know, I have enough problems you know, to deal with as is. But I think over the last 20 years, I think people have kind of bumped up against the headaches and now they'd rather, they'd rather know about it, account for it within the capital structure of the project and then just manage it that way. So we're doing a fair amount of health and safety monitoring of different construction practices and activities that can generate chemical vapors to the air and making sure those are contained and that those construction practices minimize those volatiles going out. Perhaps in a um, commercial industrial spray painting application Or maybe in a resurfacing of a parking lot, the petroleum vapors that come from that asphalt process, we're seeing the contractor groups get really concerned about how do we do this better. So it's really encouraging to see there's a real interest, I think, now in in let's not create a problem, you know, versus we'll have plenty of consultants out there that can clean up the problem after it's happened, once it's a spill, right? Since 2006, you've really expanded uh, your client base. You'd said once that you're that you kind of were influenced by a Japanese approach to business. Oh yeah, this is going to get a little high minded, but uh, here it is: the Japanese have a concept called oma tanashi. And it translates as hospitality. The Japanese are focused on always providing the best service and hospitality uh, with an expectation of nothing in return. 
And here, it, it, we might not, not take it to that level. And we do get paid for our services, so we do get something in return. But I try and coach and mentor our guys to really try to selflessly meet client goals. And by that, I mean, you know, create a joyful experience by making things easy for our clients. I've just found customers, they really, res- and our clients and customers really respond to convenience, consistency, and connection. And if you can kind of equate that to a mindset versus billing goals or, you know, strict finances, it seems to translate better. And the guys really tend to take into account the clients and their needs. So, convenience, consistency, connection. That's Robert's strategy to nurture good client relationships and keep business flowing. And to facilitate this, he maintains his company at the boutique level. With six employees, there's always plenty to share. I like our small size. So sometimes we will avoid the much larger projects because it's it's outside of our scale. I would have to staff up a little more than I would want to manage and have to deal with the complications of that many people. Our clients really like being able to get the the project manager on the phone and have direct contact with them. We don't have a deep vertical structure in that we like being the one-stop shop for anything that could arise during the course of the projects and be available as an informational source and not split things up between kind of a younger staff and the older manager. You know, as the business grows larger and larger, sometimes the principals that have the most experience and knowledge of the actual work, you wind up getting pulled away and doing human resource concerns or maybe more financial concerns or accounting issues. And you you really get pulled away from doing the things you're really good at and where your expertise lies. And having been in a bigger firm, I saw that happen. And we just, we want to stay small and boutique and and do great work within our deal space. What are some of the challenges you see on the horizon for business and for real estate developers and so forth with regard to environmental issues? The figures that come to mind for me are, you know, 40% of the world's population lives on the coastline. And in 50 years, you know, what are these coastlines going to look like? An average rise of six to eight inches, you're talking about some pretty serious displacement. I can't really speak to the tropical or equatorial areas where there's a lot of islands. But, I, you know, if, if you think about Florida and the, the ocean level coming up, Six inches a foot, uh, that's a lot of people that are going to have to think about moving. Are we going to have to clean up a bunch of industrial properties and port properties so that we don't start leaking more and more contamination into the ocean? A lot of oil terminals and large petroleum distribution and manufacturing centers are located on water. What are we going to do if the ocean level rises three, five feet into, you know, those industrial areas? That's a concern. Uh, Another interesting concern is indoor air quality. There's going to be a greater and greater demand on the development community to provide more healthy workspaces could be as simple as more glass front buildings with more natural light to HVAC systems that are really protective of the breathing air. Of course, there's always emerging construction practices that turn out to be environmentally challenging. But I think the newer buildings are really, you know, the architects and the designers and the engineers are really starting to adapt and, and make healthier, safer buildings. That's the thing. In our day and age, our attitudes towards climate change and the environment have already evolved. So there's never been a better time to look ahead and take on the challenge of environmental services. 
I think now's a great time to grow. I think there's going to be a lot of demand for environmental services over the next five, 10 years. So I see it, you know, for the smaller boutique firms because of all the consolidation post COVID and during COVID, I think it's a really great time to operate a small troubleshooter shop. I'm really encouraged right now. I'm looking forward to the next, you know, three to five years. There's a lot of stuff out there that can be adaptively reused and recycled. It's how creative and how much headache the developer wants to take on to reuse that existing structure. A good business niche simply keeps on giving, year after year. So if you're an entrepreneur setting your sights on the next venture, try the Robert Bronner method. First, start with what makes you feel driven, passionate. Learn all you can learn about your industry of interest. That could mean speaking to seasoned professionals or getting some practical experience. The more specialized your knowledge, the better placed you are to jump on the next opportunity. Check out the blue corners of the ocean. That's areas that aren't yet saturated and can bring on new profiles. In fact, even once you've been in your field for a few years, ask yourself, where should I go next? How could I use my skill set in other industries? No matter where that takes you, keep in mind what makes your services unique. Your niche will always bring you further than you can see. Remember, crises will happen in every professional sector. So when business is shaky, stay in touch with your network and take stock. Look out for new regulations and processes too. Things will move fast, you'll need to keep your finger on the pulse. And after the storm, keep looking to the future. You'll be better equipped to solve situations as they arise. And as Robert would say, Problem solving, it rarely occurs uh, in the sunshine when you're eating a popsicle. You know, it really happens in stressful situations under difficult conditions with timing or financial constraints. But the bigger the risk, the bigger the reward uh, is the way I see it. So go big or go home. We'd like to thank Robert Bronner for showing us the value of risk today. His contribution to the environmental industry is a lesson in motivation and resilience. Do you want to hear more In Good Companies? Then subscribe, rate, and review the show. We'll get to hear from you, and you'll help us make more episodes with even bigger guests. Win-win, right? In Good Companies is a podcast from Cadence Bank, member FDIC, Equal Opportunity Lender. Our production team is Natalie Barron and Edie Pengeli. Our executive producer is Danielle Kernell. This podcast has been in collaboration with the team at Lower Street. Writing and production from Lise Lovati, narration by Daria Lawson, and sound design and mixing by Ben Cranell. This podcast is provided as a free service to you and is for general informational purposes only. Cadence Bank and its affiliates make no representation or warranties as to the accuracy, completeness, or timeliness of the content in the podcast. The podcast is not intended to provide legal, accounting, or tax advice and should not be relied upon for such purposes. The views and opinions expressed by the host and guests in this podcast are solely their own current opinions regarding the subject matters discussed in the podcast and are based on their own perspectives. Such views, perspectives, and opinions do not reflect those of Cadence Bank or any of its affiliates or the companies in which any guest is or may be affiliated. The production and presentation of this podcast by Cadence Bank does not imply the expression of any opinion on part of Cadence Bank or any of its affiliates.